Well, John, I know everybody's been saying this to you all day, but I want to say it too. Welcome back. We missed well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's good and to this be is, back. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this is fast becoming my favorite time of year. You come back to the pulpit, the college students come back, and it's a great time. college football is about to start. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> I've got some questions. You know, normally... Uh, when, when people know that I'm going to be doing one of these Q&As, I am flooded with suggestions and questions. And today I've asked dozens of people, what, what should I ask? And every single person has said, I don't have any questions. So this is a well-taught church. Either that or they're totally disinterested in me. <laughs> well, I've got some questions. Oh, good. So, By the way, this is Phil Johnson, for those of you who don't know. Phil Johnson, an elder here. Um, Gifted, gifted teacher of God's Word, preacher, um, theologian, and the director of Grace to You and all of its ministries all over the world. And you and I have been working together for since when? Since, uh, well, when I was working at Moody Press, 1980, 1981. Yeah, that's where we first met. We were, I was doing a book on the family and you edited that book and that started a relationship and I hired him away from Moody, brought him here. and. It was the, the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> From my viewpoint, it sure was. I'm yeah. glad you feel that way. Yeah. In fact, you made me nervous this morning when you said that you like to live stream the service mm -hmm. while you're gone. Especially when you're preaching. <sighs> That's, you now, you told me once, years ago, 35 years ago, I think you said to me that it's hard for you to listen to other preachers because you're always thinking, he should have gone to that text. He should have included this cross-reference. And, and yeah. I never think of that when I'm listening to you. <laughs> I know better I love than to that. listen to the men who preach here. I know better than that. You know, you told me years ago that you would never preach. I did. That's you said, right. I will never preach. I can't do that. And I said, you better be careful what you tell the Lord you won't do. <laughs> so, no, I love listening to, to you especially, but to all the men who preach here. I have, well, I have no criticisms at all. I'm just delighted. We're glad to have you back. Well, I'd you. rather listen to you than me any day. So. <laughs> well, yeah, no. All right. Well, it's been, uh, I did the math on this today. I was surprised to realize it's been almost three years since the Strange Fire Conference. Hmm. And I'll bet you've had the same experience I have. Every place I've spoken since then, and, and this is literally true without an exception, Every place I've spoken in the past three years, I encounter people who tell me they are former charismatics who were led out of the movement because of the book or the conference. And those messages that are out there on YouTube are still having an impact. Uh, is, that, is that your experience as well? <clears throat> you know, when we, um, when we decided to do the, the uh, Strange Fire Conference, it, it, you know, the whole charismatic movement had, had run loose. It had run free. And there had never been any public, uh, widespread outcry from the evangelical church. I mean, you know this because you, you live in the world of, uh, of the evangelical ministries, media ministries and publishing. Uh, nobody was writing a book to call this into biblical account. N nobody was confronting it. Nobody was, uh, was willing to step up and criticize the movement. And the movement was wreaking havoc. Uh, it, it, it always does. It still does. Uh, it was wreaking havoc here, but maybe the, the, the greatest damage it was doing was, was outside of America. One could argue that the greatest damage it has done is in Africa. Yeah. I don't know if you saw the news story. This week, there was a story about a charismatic pastor who literally killed a woman in the service because he put one of the speakers on top of her and claimed a miracle that she would live, and he jumped on the speaker, and it crushed this woman to death. Yeah. Um, that kind of that, thing is fairly regular. Um, the, we, don't see, we don't see the extreme horrors of it, we see enough, but at my, my obligation as a faithful servant of the Lord was to basically lead an outcry. So that's why we had the Strange Fire Conference and we, we, we made no attempt to soft pedal the issue. We just we hit it head on, brought in a lot of people including Conrad and Bayway from Africa and he gave a great message. If you haven't heard that, you need to download it and listen to what he says about what's going on in Africa. Um, I knew there would be a number of effects. I knew for one that we would be attacked back, and we were. 
from some people who are sort of the quasi-intellectuals, and you got into some broadcast uh, conversations on that level, uh, from, from the people who, uh, who, who just hate us because we, we question the legitimacy of their experience and all of that. But I also knew that there were lots of people out there who just needed to know the truth. And you're absolutely right. Everywhere I have gone since that conference, people have told me they have listened to that and it has led them out of the movement. It has delivered them from what uh, they now see was a very dangerous situation. Uh, th this, is a great <clears throat> this is a great time to be alive in, in, in the sense that when you do something once, it, it lives on forever in the media, whether it's YouTube or some other media form. Um, it's a good thing that the truth lives on because everything else does too. So we were able to, to create an event that has almost a permanent life, and those messages keep going and going and going. And I had first begun to experience that when back in the 70s I wrote a book called Charismatic Movement. That was called uh, The Charismatics. And then we did another one called Charismatic Chaos. And I, I saw the fruit of those books, people coming to a true faith in Christ out of that movement, out of that movement. And so my experience with the fact that God had His people out there and they just needed the truth led to the conference, and it's, uh, it's even exponentially beyond what the books have done. Those messages on YouTube and other forums have, uh, have been a tremendous tool to bring people out of that movement. Yeah, and, um, you know, don't overplay the critics. Actually. Uh, there have been two vocal critics, uh, Michael Brown, who occasionally still takes pot shots. The other was Rodney Howard Brown, you know, the Holy Ghost bartender guy, the mm -hmm. laughter guy who threatened me with a lawsuit because I put one of his videos <laughs> online that he tried to take off because it had the record of how foolish his foolishness is. Uh, but beyond that, most of the feedback I've gotten has been entirely positive. Yeah, and I think there's a, a short shelf life in the lives of people in that movement. I think the movement keeps going because it finds new people. But when you buy into that and you're not healed and you're not well and you get cancer and your friends die and life is bad, you begin to question the prosperity gospel. You be begin to question the lies. So the turnover in the movement is constant. It's constantly doesn't, it constantly doesn't deliver what it promises. It's, it's, and, and that, that's, that's stock and trade for, for lots of preachers, not just the charismatics. Um, Joel Osteen, who is a charismatic, by the way, many people don't know that, um, is, is telling people everything's going to be wonderful if they just think that way. The turnover in any ministry that, that talks like that, that advocates that, is going to be great. But there are, always, there are always enough new people to come in the back door when the disillusioned people go out. But knowing those people that are in that movement are so totally disillusioned. I, I, I go back to a story, in the, the biggest charismatic church in our area a few years ago um, announced that um, they had uh, appointed a new, a new um, prophet who was going to evangelize the world, he was going to do signs and wonders and miracles, wonders and miracles. And an apostle from Kansas City came and laid hands on him. And he fell over dead with a brain aneurysm. In that very service. In that meeting. Yeah. Um, and the response was, well, he was going to do that, and, and the, the, the prophecy was so powerful and his power was so great that the devil killed him. Well, if you're in a church that you think the devil is in control of, you're going to leave. I remember talking to people who came here and I said, why did you leave a charismatic church to come here? And they said, because we cannot leave, we cannot live under the sovereignty of Satan. So that's an illustration of the nonsense that when exposed uh, over time or in an incident like that makes people wonder what the real truth is. And we've always been eager to put books and messages and even the conference out there so people who are questioning can find real biblical answers. The question I keep getting is, is there going to be a sequel either to the book or the conference? Would we do another conference? So what, what do you tell people when they ask you I that? say I hope so. <laughs> that, that's been my answer. I'd love to do uh, Strange Fire Part 2, at least the conference, if not the book. Maybe we could call it Stranger Fire. Yeah. <laughs> or I thought a good sequel would be Holy Smoke. That would be good. That would be good. 
Or maybe unholy smoke. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Even better. I'm, look, I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm game for, for anything. All right. So, I mean, we'll we start, just want to proclaim the truth. We'll start planning it. Does, it. does it ever trouble you that it seems like none of the other A-list uh, evangelical leaders are willing to speak out with any kind of force or clarity on this issue? It's like this is supposed to be off the table for criticism. Sure, it bothers me. We've had that conversation. I don't understand that. Uh, I, I, I understand the um, sort of personal human desire to be loved and to be popular and to, to develop a widespread audience and, and not offend people. But I'm just compelled by the truth. The, the truth is everything. I, I, I do not understand how anybody can say he's a minister of God, he's a man of God, he's a minister of the gospel, he's a teacher of the Word of God, and let a massive, massive movement of gross misrepresentation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures go on unassaulted. I, I just, I, I just, I think if we don't contend earnestly for the faith, we aren't faithful to Scripture. Do you think the time is coming when circumstances and, and the, just the sheer uh, weirdness of all that's going on is going to force more people to speak out, or do you think... Well, I've been thinking that for a long time, Phil. I've been yeah. thinking that for years and years and years, and I, I'm, I'm still asking the question, why don't people say anything? But you, you can remember even Christian publishers in the past who wouldn't publish a book right. that was anti-charismatic or that called into question anybody that, was, that had deviated from biblical truth, unless it was some kind of real open heresy, yeah. but even that was hard for them to, to uh, confront. There, there is a, there's a pervasive tolerance in our whole culture, and um, it, it shows up, it shows up in, in, in the media world too. Um, and I don't think it's just the threat of lawsuits, although that's, that's, that's a reality. You said lawsuits are threatened to you. I've had the same kind of threats as well. Um, yeah, I told them, bring it. Yeah. Come on, let's do well, it. Well, you know, you're a few, not to, the reason these little ropes are here in the front is because we had a yeah. prophet from Scotland come That was up. a year ago this week, in fact. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah. I tried to forget that. <laughs> he, uh, he came it's up on here. YouTube. You'll never it's forget on it. YouTube. <laughs> he started screaming at me, and he had been sent by his charismatic church in Scotland to confront me as a heretic and all. No, I honestly, look, I don't understand how you can say you're fulfilling your calling in ministry and not confront error. Right. How can you do that? Um, that wasn't a, it was Luther, I think, who said, uh, you can fight on a lot of fronts, but if you're not fighting on the front where the battle rages the hottest, you're unfaithful. Yeah. I mean, it's always been, it's always been to me, it's just a sense of obligation. I don't, I don't want to particularly pick a fight. I don't, I'm, not, um, I'm not a kind of combative person personally, but for the truth, for the sake of the truth and the honor of the Lord, I, I think we have to fight where the battle rages. Well, and particularly the... Prosperity gospel, which, let's be honest, that, that is the vast majority of the charismatic movement. That is the dominant view among charismatics, and, and it's massive worldwide, and it's a corruption of the gospel. So if what binds us together is the gospel, then it would seem to me even the, uh, you, you know, even some of the mild charismatics ought to be making that a focus of their polemic, and yet that's not Yeah, happening. I mean, it, it, it's very similar to the cry you hear all the time uh, to Muslims. If they don't support terrorism, why don't they expose the terrorists in their ranks? Right. And the same thing would be true of, if you say you're, a, you're an evangelical and you're unwilling to expose the spiritual terrorists, uh, then, then you're, you're, you're a part of it. You're, you're clearly a part of it. I have to be honest and say that, you know, my spiritual hero, you know this, is the Apostle Paul. And um, the Apostle Paul said things like this, if anybody preach another gospel, let him be damned. Uh, you don't hear that. If you're preaching a truncated gospel, a warped gospel, and there's a lot of components to the gospel that have to be right, or it is a warped gospel, it is another gospel, let him be damned. Um, but that's exactly the way Paul spoke. And he even gave lists of sinners that would never enter the kingdom of God. It was specific sins, specific iniquities. 
Evangelicalism has re been redefined by, by the psychology of the age, the zeitgeist, you know, the, the attitude of the culture. And uh, what we see in the prosperity gospel or any sort of culturally adapted uh, perspective on the gospel that makes things acceptable is, is a massive level of unfaithfulness hmm. to God. Um, we have to speak the truth. It, you, you, I know you read this because it was, it was everywhere. In the last two weeks, the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton uh, did a study of evangelism techniques with Lifeway, which is a Southern Baptist publishing arm, and they concluded that we can't evangelize anymore by talking about death and hell because nobody cares. So we've got to stop talking about death and hell because nobody cares. Uh, what they care about is here and now, life and success, prosperity, me becoming everything I can be. That's such a narcissistic culture. So the, the takeaway from this study was we've got to change our evangelism because people aren't interested in life after death. I mean, they've basically been sort of conditioned to believe that uh, we have nothing to fear, you know, people die and go to heaven and come back and it's all, you know, rainbows and pretty horses and beautiful That's music. actually a, a recipe for the spread of the prosperity gospel. It is. If, it is. if it the idea it. is we, we have to give people a message that, uh, you know, offers what they're interested in. Yeah. And what they're interested in is here and now. So the takeaway was we've got to start, stop evangelizing people on the basis of death and hell because they don't care about that. My takeaway was this, if they don't care about that, we've got to double down on death and hell because that's what they have to care about because that's the reality. So the, the evangelical takeaway is, well, we don't want to talk about that anymore because nobody's interested. My response was, because nobody's interested, we must talk about that. And I don't know why I'm the guy who seems to always be the, the odd man out confronting everything. I don't know why either, but that's what I love about you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how I got to this point. Uh, my, even Patricia said to me one time some years ago, she said, why don't you just write a book that everybody likes? <laughs> Because Phil Johnson is his editor. No. So I wrote a book called The Love of God, and a whole bunch of people hated it. <laughs> do you remember? Yeah, I do. I do. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's about the truth. I was saying to some of the people over at the University of Masters yesterday that um, if you go back, just a little way to kind of look at history, if you go back... Uh, before the Enlightenment, before the Reformation, before the Renaissance, you have a pre-modern world. And in a pre-modern modern world, talking about Western world, our, our heritage, it was impossible not to believe. It was impossible not to believe in God. It was essentially possible not to believe in the Bible because there was a dominant force, the Roman Catholic system. It was an aberrant form of, of biblical Christianity. But it was impossible not to believe because there was no alternative worldview. There wasn't an alternative worldview. There was no evolution. There was, there was essentially no secularism. Uh, there, there, was, there was no skepticism. Uh, it was a world made by God and everybody knew it and that's the way it was. So it was impossible not to believe. And then when the Enlightenment comes and, um, and the Industrial Revolution uh, after the Reformation, it became possible not to believe. Because now there's an alternative worldview. There is no God. Evolution is the reason we're here. Uh, we have no authority. There is, there's no uh, ultimate uh, fixed spiritual law. So for the first time, modernism could be defined as it's, it's possible not to believe. And then now that it's possible not to believe, you have to kind of search for the truth. Now we're in postmodernism. Postmodernism says it's impossible to believe. We've gone from it's impossible not to believe to it's possible to believe to it's impossible to believe to it's possible not to believe to it's impossible to believe. So we have a culture that doesn't want to accept the Bible at all, at all, on any level. And they still call themselves Christians if that's their sort of traditional uh, group, but basically Postmodernism says, whatever I decide is the truth is, is the truth, my truth. So the truth had to be proclaimed by faithful men when it was the dominant reality, but it had to be truthfully proclaimed. It had to be proclaimed by the Reformers and those who followed them and the Puritans when it was possible not to believe and they had to give evidences to believe. 
And now that it's almost impossible to believe, all the more reason that we've got to focus on truth. You know, I'm driven by the truth. It's, it's what drives me every single day of my life. What is the truth and how many ways can I proclaim the truth? Yep. Yeah, well, you mentioned postmodernism. The idea there is that truth is a socially constructed idea. That, so, but so it's that, not even socially constructed now. It's personally constructed. Right. But the more people who believe something, the more, like, if you can get a majority to believe an idea, then it becomes the de facto truth. And that kind of thinking has seeped into the church. And I think, frankly, that's at the, at the root of why uh, you can't get evangelical leaders to challenge the charismatic chicanery and all that because it's too popular. Well, we, we determine what's right by a survey, right. a poll. Um, the, the only one we determine what's right, and that's here. So, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, you and I, I want to include you so I have some company. We're both anachronistic. I mean, we're like people out of a different era. Yeah, it's a pre-modern idea of truth. Yeah. Well... All right, so let me shift to a different subject. There, there's been a controversy going in the evangelical world this summer that you haven't really been involved in, and that's unusual. In really? It. i got to get in yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. And I just wonder if you've been watching the, uh, the debate over the Trinity and the disagreement between men like Bruce Ware and Wayne Grudem, uh, who, who take a kind of novel view of Trinitarian doctrine. Have you been watching or following that? And can you shed any light on it, or do you even want no, to? No, no. Well, I, I know what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. I, I, I don't know what those guys think, particularly. Um, but again, why are we now, in 2016, coming up with novel ways to define the Trinity? That's where I hoped you'd go with this. What? <laughs> yeah, because What's that's... What's wrong with the way it's always been proclaimed in Scripture and understood? This is something I wanted to ask you about. This is, this is one of the most important things I learned from you uh, when I met you as a young guy, fairly fresh out of uh, Bible college, and, and it was my idea that uh, a, a great preacher is the one who finds something in the text that nobody else has ever seen, you know? Yeah. That was my idea. A lot of people have that idea. Yeah, yeah. You taught me otherwise, that the really profound truth is, the, is, is what the text says on the face of it. And all these invented secret messages are really a kind of Gnostic approach to biblical interpretation. You know, uh, Talk about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> Patricia and I were up at Lake Geneva at a Bible conference, and there was a very, very famous preacher there. And uh, I was preaching and he was preaching. This was years ago. And uh, uh, I said, what are you going to preach on tonight? And it was his, his time. And he said, I'm going to preach on, on the rapture of the church. I said, great. I said, that's great. You're going to use 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15? No, no, no. What are you going to use? He said, John 11. I said, John 11? What happened in John 11? That's the raising of Lazarus. That's the raising it? of Lazarus. <laughs> So he got up and he preached the rapture of the church from the raising of Lazarus. And afterwards he said to me, have you ever seen that in John 11? And I said, no, because it is not in John 11. <laughs> what, what are you doing? Um, that is, that, you know, the, there have been a few lessons like that that reinforce the idea that you let the text speak, right? Don't we talk about that unleashing God's yep. truth one verse at a time? Uh, the travesty of using the Bible to say anything you want to say is rampant. It has been since Scriptures were written. We, we, we understand that. But again, back to the Trinity thing. We have to get that right, and there's some people who have it wrong, and they're very popular. T.D. Jakes uh, essentially is, with regard to the Trinity, a Unitarian. He, he, he does not believe that there are three members of the Trinity. He believes there's one God who manifests Himself in three different ways at different times. This is a heresy. Modalism. It's modalism. called modalism. Yeah. This is a heresy declared a heresy thousands of years ago. Uh, but it doesn't seem to bother anybody because the view of the Trinity doesn't seem to matter. Doctrine is unimportant and it's viewed increasingly in a world that pleads for tolerance as a divisive um, uh, force. Right. And again, because he is so popular with uh, such a large audience, 
you can buy his books in most Christian bookstores, mm-hmm. most evangelical bookstores. Yeah, you can go to it, most evangelical bookstores and buy the very books that uh, condemn the truth, yeah. along with the books that proclaim the truth. Uh, well, back to the idea of, uh, n- you know, not being novel. Uh, the last time no, I did novel, it- look, look, uh, preaching is not inventing something. It's not being clever. It's simply opening up the Word of God and letting it speak. Now that's why people say, well, why do you do only Bible exposition? And my answer is, what else would I do? What do you want, my ideas? I can't even get my ideas across to Patricia. <laughs> they, don't, they don't even have weight with her. Why, 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 do I, why am I going to pass my idea? What, the, the idea of piecemealing the Bible together to show my cleverness. All I want to do uh, as, as a preacher is preach the Word, and that means I have to explain what the Bible means by what it says. That's, that, that's the whole purpose of preaching. Yeah. Uh, reading into it is, um, is not just not the best, it's wrong. Yeah, the last time I did a Q&A with you and I asked people to submit questions, uh, I kept this one. This guy sent me this question, so he wrote this. This is not my words. He said, I recall laughing loudly at one of the Together for the Gospel conferences when, as an aside in his message, John MacArthur said, I hate creativity. He says, could you ask him to expand on why he hates creativity? I think this is what you were saying. Yeah. Look, I don't mind creativity in art or design or whatever, um, some kind of human expression. But God isn't asking us to create anything. Um, I hate creativity in preaching. Uh, I don't want people to be confused between my creativity and the truth of Scripture. I don't ever want to be the issue. I don't want to get in the way of the Scripture speaking. I want to be out of the way. And one of the things I've said, just to kind of emphasize that, is. If you go to a lot of churches, particularly churches that are this large, you might see a big screen with the preacher's face on it. Uh, You'll never see that here because you don't need to see my face. You need to see your Bible and hear my voice. That's all you need. All you need to do is look at your Scripture and hear what I say to explain it to you. I'm not the issue. Focusing on me is is irrelevant. I, I, I don't want to get in the way of the Scripture. I want to be diligent enough to point you to the Scripture and get you caught up in seeing what it says. So when I say I hate creativity, I hate the idea that we could impose on the Bible uh, some of our own novelty that would in some ways um, not, not necessarily contrary, uh, counteract the Bible or give a contrary interpretation, but somehow allow us to miss the true depth of the text, Mm. which can happen if if you just start being creative and picking and choosing things in Scripture, you don't get the depth of it. But if you're committed to digging out everything that it says, that's when you penetrate the depth of it. Yeah, I have this theory that a lot of that stems from the fact that our culture is so hyper-entertained. We we are the most, uh, I mean, we're assaulted with entertainment everywhere all the time. Well, look, uh, I am not an entertainer. This is a talking head experience. I just stand here and talk. I'm amazed that people keep coming back. This is, this is not entertainment. <clears throat> there's nothing high-tech about me, there's nothing electronic. Uh, there's no flashing lights. Even when we worship here, we just, we just do what the Bible says. We take the instruments and the voices and we praise the Lord. Uh, we're not trying to create <clears throat> an atmosphere. We're not trying to induce a feeling. Um, and we, the last thing we're trying to do is entertain anybody. Uh, and I will say in all honesty, an hour of exposition of Scripture is an, is an acquired taste. It's an acquired taste. Um, people who aren't used to this get fidgety. I, I, I've preached in situations where <clears throat> maybe a, a, a kind of a charismatic environment where I've been asked to preach. And when I do what I do here, they don't really know what to do with me, but they know they're bored out of their minds because there's just nothing that grabs them, you know, sort of by the nap of their emotions and shakes them around. Uh, There's just none of that. This is all... uh, What I'm doing is talking to the mind, talking to the reason. I'm talking to you to reason these things through to the truth. That's not entertainment. 
That's um, education, but it's education that's beyond education because it's empowered education, because the truth is divine and it's carried and conveyed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You may actually overestimate uh, how many people are bored. I remember the first time I ever heard you, and I came kind of reluctantly, but you definitely No, you grabbed... came because Darlene invited you to come and you wanted to yeah, date her. That's right. <laughs> we don't have to... Re we... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It's true. It's true. I know it's true. And, uh, and yet, you grabbed me by the hair and shook me around pretty well in that first one message, yeah. Well, I think the Lord was working on a connection. It's, it's the power those. of the Word of God, too, and the, the clarity with which y you give it, I think uh, I, all of us would attest that at times you have... Uh, yeah. Well, look, I, I get that. The, the Word has power, but it's, it's not because of my experience that I get it. That's what Scripture says. Uh, the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it is a heavenly weapon. Uh, it is the sword of the Spirit. It can do some serious damage. It can tear up a person. It can put them back together again. Um, you know, the, 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 the Word of God in Scripture is, is called a lot of things. It, it, it's called a sword. It's called a hammer. It's called a plumb line. It's called a fire. Uh, so I, I believe in, and, and this, is, um, this is the foundation of everything for me, I believe in the absolute authority and power of this book. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe that the combination of the Holy Spirit empowering this already powerful divine revelation can transform lives, radically transform lives. That's all I need to know. Uh, when I came to Grace Church, I only knew one thing for sure, God would honor His Word, His Word was powerful, and His Holy Spirit did His work through His Word. So for whatever reason, and it, wa it wasn't common for people to, to approach the Bible the way I did. I just began to say, I'm just going to open the Word and let God do what He'll do through the power of His Word by His Holy Spirit. That happened at the very first Sunday I ever showed up here, back in 1969, and preached on Matthew 7. Many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, I'll say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Pretty strong stuff for your first Sunday, uh, Matthew 7. But I have ev no fear because I know this is the powerful Word of God, and in the hands of the Holy Spirit, it's going to do powerful work. That has, never, that has never changed in all the years I've been here. So I know it's not about me. When people come and they say that they, they, they listen to me, they appreciate, I, I know the real experience isn't me. The real experience is the Word of God. In fact, there's not a lot of me even in a sermon, not personal things and uh, personal illustrations, um, because that's not, I, I, I'm not a part of the Bible story. Right. I'm not in it. So why would I inject myself? Uh, so I think the experience that people are having under the preaching of the Word of God is with the Word of God and not so much with me. Yeah, no question about that. But when you preach, uh, it does come, the depth of your conviction is obvious. Yeah. And, and, you know, you said you're absolutely sure of the truth of the Word of God. And I wonder, was there ever a time in your youth or childhood where you entertained doubts about whether the Word of God was... Never was. And... You know, I mean, that's a gift from the Lord. Yeah. When you ask why I trust the Bible, it's not because somebody laid out a bunch of evidences when I was nine years old. I trust the Bible because I trust the Bible. I mean, the, word, the, the Lord did a work in my heart. And, and the more I've studied the Bible, the more it, it validates itself. Yeah. Well, that was true. Uh, I noticed that was the thing that kept going through my mind this morning to your message, because you're giving all of those ties between the Old Testament prophecies and their fulfillment in the crucifixion of Christ. And I don't see how anybody can look at how meticulously the Word yeah. of God, these ancient prophecies, were fulfilled in Christ and have any doubt about whether the Bible well, see, is that, the Word that's of God. the point. I don't need to defend the Bible. The Bible will defend itself if it's taught right. Yeah. It is its own defense. Uh, and, and I've seen that reality. It, it, it isn't that all, all of a sudden people say, wow, uh, this is the Bible because of these five reasons. The longer you sit under the preaching of the Word, the longer I study it, and it's obviously been a long, long time, the greater that conviction grows. It's never, it, I've never had any other, I've never had any doubt about that. And I think maybe because my father had no doubt about it, my grandfather, both of them preachers. Uh, my dad, my dad had an absolutely 
fixed confidence in the Word of God. And so I, I, I sort of saw that in him, and he was a preacher who studied the Word of God, and the more he studied it, uh, the more the truthfulness of it gripped his heart. So I, I, I kind of built on that foundation. And then I went to study under Dr. Charles Feinberg, who was the most brilliant person I've ever known, and he had that same exact unwavering confidence in every word in the Bible. And uh, that was another part of the foundation for me, and, uh, and so I, I had that commitment to Scripture, and that has, it has never wavered at all. Uh, people sometimes say to me, Does it, do you worry about what people are going to think when you say something? When you get up to preach and you know you're going this way or that way, you're going to say this or that, do you worry about what people are going to think or if you're going to offend somebody? And I can honestly say it, that thought has never entered my mind, never. I, I never think, well, what's somebody going to think about this? All I think is, is this the Word of God? That's an amazing gift, too, because, you but know... But that's the basis of conviction. You know, personally, you, when I think John MacArthur's live-streaming this, that's all I think about. What's he going to think? <laughs> no, you know better than that. But look, conviction... Oh, conviction is a, is a lost word in this culture. Yeah. Conviction is everything for the preacher. It's everything. Uh, starting this week, Tuesday morning for four hours or whatever, I'm going to have a new batch of seminary students coming in, and I'm going to talk to them about being expositors of Scripture and having convictions. Convictions, uh, they're, they're the, the strength of your ministry. In fact, leadership is about conviction. Leader, leader, you can't lead if you don't have certain convictions in, in, any, in any way. You've got to say, this is true, this is what we must do. And certainly from a biblical standpoint, it is confidence in the Word of God that leads to faithful study of the Word of God that produces fixed convictions, and those convictions become um, the, the fiber of your preaching. Hmm. Now, when you uh, told me we we're going to do a Q&A and you wanted me to ask you questions, the one thing you said was you didn't want me to ask you about uh, th this year's election, the <laughs> politics and, and all of that. So I have to ask you that because, <laughs> because I'm full of mischief plus. Yes, you are. Everybody, that's the question we're getting at Grace to I You know, and everything. So, so uh, here's the way I want to ask it. Um, you, you, as a practice, I, I don't think in, in all the years I've been with you, I've never known you to endorse a candidate or get involved in party politics or any of that. Why is that? Explain why you pretty much steer clear of politics. Well, um, first of all, because, this is important, what happens in America politically has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God, nothing. Whether America is Republican or Democrat, whether it is libertarian or socialist, whether it, is, whether it becomes a, a communist country or, or, or whether it becomes a, a dictatorship, what happens in America has absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. We don't fight on that level. I got a lot of battles. None of them are political. That doesn't mean that I'm indifferent. Look, I hate sin. I have no tolerance for those who advocate sin, for the platform that says, we think you should kill unborn babies and we think homosexuality is some kind of norm, and we're supportive of transgender, and um, we want everybody to be free to be whatever they want to be. I have no tolerance for those sins because the Scripture has no tolerance for those sins. And we have to preach against them because they need to be exposed so people know they're sinning and can hopefully be rescued from their sin. We have to say that no adulterer, no... A uh, homosexual will enter the kingdom of heaven. So that immediately m makes me a problem politically because politics is the art of compromise, and you're seeing that now. I can go back to uh, 
previous election and the Bush election, and there was a group called the Moral Majority, uh, Jerry Falwell's group. And the Moral Majority was big stuff, so the Republicans were trying to define themselves as moral, moral, moral. Here we are now, <laughs> later, and who's moral? Who's moral? Um, who cares who's moral? There's no moral majority. There's not even a moral minority. And you have somebody who's so conservative like Rubio saying, we've got to stop being negative on homosexuals. Well, I can't do that and, and represent the kingdom of God. I don't have to pick them out, but I have to preach against every sin and call every sinner to the recognition of sin and judgment and call him to gospel repentance and faith. So we're, we've seen, well, the, the, d during Obama's election, for the first time the Democratic Party had an, an anti-God, anti-Bible, immoral agenda, kill babies, pro-homosexual, pro-homosexual marriage. That's new in our nation in the last couple of elections. Now the Republicans can't survive unless they get on that bandwagon to some degree. Maybe not abortion. The abortion train has been slowed down by v videos of babies in the womb. That's what slowed it down. It's not the right or wrong of it, it's the reality of it, the, the human reality of it. So I, I've, I've never believed that politics has anything to do with the kingdom of God. Uh, if we were a uh, low taxation, capitalistic, uh, self-enterprise, everybody takes care of himself kind of country as um, the right wing believe, I, I would be glad for that because I think that's biblical. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, right? If you don't take care of your household, you're worse than an infidel. I don't think handouts help anybody. I think they're destructive. I think that we're watching the death of inner cities, massive immorality, 75 percent of kids born out of wedlock, out of father. I mean, these are all devastating realities of, of, a, of, a, of a society that has been stripped of its dignity. Um, so yeah, I, I think there are biblical models for how society ought to function. But none of the candidates really promote that. No, so, no, so, no, they don't. But I'm right. just saying, but even so, even if we were that way, maybe we used to be that way, it has nothing to do with the kingdom of yeah. God because the kingdom of God is built one soul at a time as a sinner puts his trust in Christ. Well, you, look, if, if you're in the first century Roman Empire, you, you, you've got rampant sin and no Christian influence, right? Because Christianity just came into existence. So nobody had any Christian influence. There was no Christian morality. The Roman Empire was just, just infested with every vile thing. But it had nothing to do with the growth of the kingdom of God, the proclamation of the truth. What happens, sadly, is that churches try to straddle that, and then they lose their voice. Um, I spoke... Um, the first part of my time away, I, I went to the Western Conservative Summit in Denver, which is the largest conservative meeting outside Washington, D.C. Thousands of people gathered in the, convention, in the Denver Convention Center. They said, would you come and speak? And I said, well, look, I will, but I don't know if you want me because I'm, I'm going to say some things that probably are going to surprise some people. So I, I, just, I just gave a biblical message. Um, I, I kind of reiterated the two messages I did here, what kind of candidate can God bless? What's God doing in the world? And then I preached the gospel and called people to put their trust in Jesus Christ as the only hope for anybody, regardless of what happens in America. Um, missionaries through the years have gone to countries all over the world to preach the gospel to every creature, fulfilling the Great Commission without regard for what the government was, what the, what the social structure was. Um, but that's, that's irrelevant. Having said that, however, I think we have to always come down on the side of righteousness and what is right. So um, personally, I have to find a way to vote, to support that which is closest to what is right, if that's the only choice I've got. 
I, I have to, I can't stand idly by um, and say everybody's bad. I've got to say, that's worse. And, and I've got to act in that way, personally. But there's no sense in talking about politics because, again, that has nothing to do with the gospel and the kingdom of God. If, if, uh, if, if we go down the train, we're going, and if it continues that way, and we get Hillary Clinton as, as president and everything that um, is part of that whole platform that is against God, against the Scripture, um, everything that is not just criminal but immoral uh, escalates and escalates and escalates, in no way does that hinder Christ building His church. It's just that we're going to have to approach it honestly. My concern is not what's happening in the country. My concern is what's happening in the church as it gets sucked into this stuff in the country and no longer will speak to those issues. Yeah, that's a remarkable thing about your ministry over the years that uh, I, I think escapes some people. If you survey the books you've done, and like you said, there are, there are a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of books that are controversial, but your critiques have always been aimed at the church, not the culture. And uh, it's as if mm -hmm. uh, you, you believe the moral meltdown, even in America, is more the responsibility of a church that's failed its duties exactly. than the secular culture. There's no point in berating the secular culture if the church is putting on a circus. Well, I mean, look at the Scripture. In the book of Revelation, Jesus wrote seven letters. He didn't write them to the city hall. He wrote them to the church. That's a good line. <laughs> we are salt and light in the world. We are the only hope. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. And when men twist, pervert that or are unwilling to proclaim it, the church becomes useless. And that's again... and. I mean, that's the point in Revelation. Jesus said, you keep going that direction, I'll blow out your candle. I'll, I'll remove you. You're, you're useless. I'll spew you out of my mouth, He said to Laodicea. So in order for the church to do its work in the world, it has to be faithful, it has to be bold, and it has to proclaim the truth. You do it in love. I don't think we could be accused of being unkind or harsh. Uh, we, we don't rail in inflammatory ways against homosexuality uh, as if that was the only sin. Um, and, and we understand that we live in a world where that will be a sin and even more so all the time because it's being advocated as if it's, a, if it's normal. Uh, but it's not a matter of picking on things like that, but it is a matter of being faithful to call sin, sin, and to point people to the truth, the only hope in the gospel. Next year will be the 500th anniversary of Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the church door of Wittenberg. Um, I've commented several times that it seems to me the evangelical movement of today is in a worse state than medieval Roman Catholicism was. Yeah, sure. Well, if we can find the right church door and you can edit the 95, I'll put it up again. <laughs> we. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I mean, only capable I of three points. That's, no, and they have to be alliterated. <laughs> <laughs> I w w look. We we post theses every day. Yep. Every Sunday, I post one here. Every day of the week, we post them on. If you all don't read the Grace to You blog, you need to do that on a daily basis. There are other really fine blogs. The Seminary blog is really good. The Master Seminary TMS .edu. Um, Triple Gate blog written by some of our graduates, great stuff. There, there are doors where this stuff is posted all the time. The problem is um, there's so much other stuff being posted all over the place that you can't, you can't find your way to the truth yep. very often. But uh, we, I just did a series some months ago on Christ's call for Reformation, the, those seven letters. I forget when, just not too long ago. Then I did a message at T4G, which I summed up that, and that's heading toward a book, and that book will come out called Christ's Call for Reformation. So let's just call that my thesis nailed to the door of Grace Church. All right. And, and uh, you know, That was a great series, too. Well, look, it, there, there, it seems to me that there has to be one just about every two or three months. Some yep. other error begins to get life, and, and we have to confront it, which is the wonderful thing about 
being in a church and having a pulpit and having a daily radio program and television program and, and, and writing and having so many fronts and so many people coming out of our ministry who help us with all that, that we can, we can continue to contend for the truth on so many public uh, fronts. Yeah, and not to sound too pessimistic, though I have said I think evangelicalism, the evangelical movement is in a deplorable state. I have to say that uh, having been a Christian now for 40 years, looking back, I think things were worse in the 70s when I got saved than they are today. Would that be your perspective as well? Yeah. I mean, it's easier to find a church with expository preaching and not, not that it's easy by any means, but there are a lot more people out there, uh, many of whom have been influenced. I think we've been able to generate a commitment to Bible exposition, a widespread commitment. Some of it I hear, and it makes me shudder. <laughs> but look, back in the 70s, evangelical church was kind of church. It, it, it kind of was one size fits all, right? Yep. I could go to your church, you could go to my church, we could go to this church, that church, the other. And they all kind of sang the same hymns. Yeah, and everything was about stuff. an inch deep. Everybody, you know, it's like a birdbath, you know, yeah. an inch deep. Um, but it was kind of the same. You could go from church to church to church, and it was kind of the same. Now you have absolutely no idea what is going to come out of a church. Um, it's kind of the day of the unchurch. People don't even want to call it a church. They give it some goofy name. Um, and it, it's very often church, um, quasi churches are basically planted by entrepreneurial people with no training. But at the same time, Reformed theology has made a massive, massive resurgence. And the truth is being proclaimed across the world, and uh, sound biblical doctrine is being preached across the world. But it's never, in my mind, it's never had so much competition. And I grew up, and I could say churches had a kind of a traditional approach, and they were all sort of the same, and they preached the gospel, and they talked about the Lord, and they talked about living a life of obedience, but it, but it didn't have a defined theology. Uh, theology is much more defined than today than it was. Uh, but at the same time, there are so many more aberrations than there have ever been. Uh, it is the greatest revival of sound doctrine in the history of the world we're living in right now. Hmm. And it's being spread all over the globe. At the same time, it is, there is an equal proliferation of every possible kind of deviation from what would be sound doctrine. So it's, in, in one sense, it's the best of the best, and in the other sense, it's the multiplication of the worst of the worst. It's as if we're living in the last days. Yeah. It's like everything has exploded. The truth has exploded. Error has exploded. Yeah. And now labels don't mean anything. You say you're evangelical, what does that mean? Yeah. mean anything. Um, give us an update on this, um, this measure that uh, got quite a bit of news, SB 1146, which was a threat, yeah. a threat to the university. Well, the, the California Senate, there's a congressman by the name of Lara, L-A-R-A, who's a homosexual, and um, he put through a bill uh, through the California Senate that would force Christian universities, Christian colleges and schools to stop any discrimination against homosexuals at all. Or they would, first of all, be subject to lawsuits. This is what this is all about. All these bills are about is to allow somebody who's a homosexual, who believes he's being um, offended or um, somehow his rights are being violated, to sue. He needs safe space. He, well, that's, yeah, that's another issue. That's, that's the trend toward the, the loss of the most defining American freedom, which is freedom of speech. Yeah. That's going to go away in the reverse of everything. But so the idea was if you're a Christian school, you are discriminating against homosexualities and you're in violation of the law. So you will, your students will not have access to any government loans or any government scholarship funding. Even though Christian people pay taxes, they're not going to have access to that money. We don't get any money from the government, but students do because the, gov the government provides Cal Grant in the state of California. 
So they were going to say that you can't get Cal grants for students at your school unless you're in full compliance with all the rights of homosexuals. So they targeted specifically Christian schools, that's what it said. So I, some other uh, Christian colleges and universities, leaders got together and they contacted us and they said, uh, would you sign this letter? We're going to write this letter to the Senate, state. I looked at it and I said, I can't sign this. I can't sign this. Because this was, this was arguing from a platform, a social platform. I said, I can't, I can't sign in an argument on a social platform for this. I'm going to write my own letter. So I wrote my own letter from a biblical standpoint. And I sent it to the California Senate. We can't comply with this because of Scripture, because of the Word of God, and just, you know, a couple of pages of all of that. Um, if that happened, it would probably mean that the um, Masters University students would lose about $2 million a year. Mm. Uh, I'm not worried about that. The Lord would provide another way, and I was ready to see that happen. But all of a sudden, things began to change, and they began to change really dramatically. Well, I have to add one other component. There's a thing called Title IX, which came in in 1978, which the federal government passed to, to make sure that this was part of the feminist movement, to make sure that schools were giving equal amount of athletic scholarships to women as men. So um, everybody kind of has to acquiesce to Title IX, and, you know, we're, we're always, you know, working to be sure we do that, giving equal privileges to men and women. Uh, in terms of athletic scholarships, things like that. The, gov the federal government then extended that without writing anything else, extended that to include homosexuals. So they said that means you have to, you have, to have equal, equal rights to all transgender, homosexual, whatever, LBGTQ people. So we said we can't do that. A lot of schools said we can't do that. We're not going to do that. So the federal government came up with an exemption. And they, they granted an exemption to institutions that filed for an exemption from that, that mandate. So the Master's University received the exemption that we, we are exempt from the requirement to accept the LBGTQ person on all levels. We're exempt from that by the federal government allowing it. Well, the federal government doesn't like that exemption, so the administration, the current White House administration published a shame list, public list of all the schools that have that exemption to heap shame on us. That list then became the list that the homosexual lobby would go after because we already have declared our position against homosexuals. So we would then be the target schools that they would come after and sue. So it was not just the loss of scholarship money to the students who come there, it was the threat of lawsuits and they already knew who we were. Hmm. So they wouldn't have to try to find us because we'd already declared who we were. So this was going to go down all the way to Governor Brown's desk and there was pretty much agreement he was going to sign it until this happened. They all of a sudden realized that 80% of the students that receive a Cal grant are minority students, 80 percent of them, and that this would be a devastating blow to minority families who couldn't go to their college of choice. It had nothing to do with the morality of it or the immorality of it. It, f it fell on its face because this guy wasn't going to be able to survive the animosity that would come from the minority community. So all of a sudden, in, in a couple of days, it went away. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that's permanent. I don't think they, they're not going to quit on these kinds of things. It just gives us an opportunity to be faithful and to lead the parade and be the point of the spear, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, no, the Bible's not going to change, and we're not going to change. It seems clear that there, there is a time of persecution coming oh. if, if the culture keeps going the way it is, uh, and, you know, maybe that'll lead to the purification of the church because the prosperity persecution, gospel. Right. Persecution always leads to the purification of the church. Um, we're we're going to be fine uh, no matter what, no matter what they take away. Again, it has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. The Lord will find another way to, to accomplish His work. I'm, I'm excited to see what that's going to look like. 
Compromise is not an option for us. We're going to live and die for the truth to the very end. Uh, and that's our commitment. That's what I love about you. Uh, some personal questions. Uh, I mean, personal in the sense that you said this morning, for example, that uh, you've spent the summer reading and thinking about stuff. And I was curious, what have you been reading and what are you thinking about? Or do, uh, or do we have to wait until we hear it in your sermons? You know, Austin Duncan came to see me and he opened up the back of his car and he had a whole bunch of books laying there. He said, I I'm giving you all these books to read. So he gave me a bunch of books to read. Uh, and then Jay Flowers gave me a book to read. Uh, and, and I have I've read some really fascinating books. Um, one that I would recommend to all of you, it's called uh, For the Glory. It's by Duncan Hamilton, and it is the story of Eric Little, the great Olympic 400-meter um, champion from the 20s uh, who went to Japan and or China and died as a missionary in a Japanese concentration camp. It's incredibly brilliantly written testimony. I, I think every seminary student should be required to read that because it demonstrates such grace and humility in a dire situation. Mm. Eric Little, his story. We all know the chariots of fire side of the story, but the rest of the story is what is so a absolutely incredible, beautifully right. written. I, uh, it, was a, it was a riveting experience to read that. Then Jay Flowers gave me a book called MacArthur at War. <laughs> and I, I looked at it and thought, is this a, biogra a biographical? <laughs> but it turned out to be General Douglas MacArthur. And, uh, a so distant who, cousin of yours. Yeah, he's a distant relative. And, uh, and, I, and I read that. And you know what struck me through that whole thing was the sacrifice that people in this country have made. Uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of Americans in World War II on the, so on the South Pacific front and the, the Pacific Front and the European Front who gave their lives for the freedoms that people are literally trashing today, hmm. who don't, don't understand the sacrifice. We're, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who died. The chronicle of the book um, is, is just a death chronicle day after day after day. At one point, MacArthur has 1.5 million troops under him hmm. in the Pacific. And that means he's got to feed them all, house them all, move them all. He's got hundreds, if not thousands, of ships and airplanes and fronts he's fighting on. And you just go back and realize that, that, that we, we weren't the aggressor in this. You know, the Japanese came and, and just literally, you know, bombed Pearl Harbor and devastated America. And at the same time, Hitler's doing what he's doing in Europe. And, but through the years, these men, these great leaders and the men that served and women that served under them, um, made the ultimate sacrifice, and they're still doing it today. And I, I just don't think, I mean, I think that's noble stuff, and I, I just don't think people who trash America and what America is understand the sacrifices that have been made. Uh, it's a travesty. So I, I enjoyed reading that. And then I'm always interested in Israel. Um, I love Israel. All, all my favorite people are Jewish, with a few Gentile exceptions. But um, uh, Jesus, Paul, Peter, you know. So. Um, so I read Operation Thunderbolt, which is uh, a chronicle of the Entebbe raid back in the 70s under yeah. Idi Amin, uh, an incredible story of another moment in history when God preserved His people Israel, hmm. brilliantly written by a man named Saul David. Hmm. So uh, I also uh, have purposely been reading through and trying to analyze the book of Isaiah to uh, with a view to maybe uh, when I finish the Gospel of John, taking a look at Isaiah, because it's always been a book that uh, uh, I, I, can't, I can't go through the whole book. It's 66 chapters. You know, we'd all die in chapter 6. So, <laughs> but there are some elements of Isaiah that I, I'm fascinated with, and it's, par it's primarily the last part, which is God's promise for the future. So I did some work on that. Um, now, I've done the math on this, and... Uh... Uh, your dad lived till age 90 or thereabouts. 91. And he, he, 91, and he preached a month before he died. And I figure you're in better health than he oh. was. If you get cracking on Isaiah, you might be. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not tottering up here when I'm 90. I promise you that. Um, no, look, you don't want to tell them that. That's, that'll frighten the daylights out of them. I'm still going to be around here 10 years from now. You know, I don't know what the timetable is. Um, I know I'm in that 
time in my life by the goodness of God where I, I, I know the Word of God because I've spent all these years studying it and I don't have Alzheimer's yet, so I'm just trying to make the most of this little window before I end up with a walker somewhere trying to figure <laughs> out, you know, what I'm supposed to do. I have much more confidence in you than that. Well, yeah, I want to do what the Lord wants me to do, but there are so many young, great young preachers here that n need to preach and they're their time is coming, and, but I, I, as long as I can proclaim the Word of God, this isn't a job for me, this is, this is a calling, so it's really in the hands of the Lord. Uh, one more question, and then we'll quit, because we're over time already. Mm. Uh, just, you've got a couple of books on the horizon, The Gospel According to Paul and uh, The Systematic Theology. Did you want to do a yeah, commercial for Yeah, thank you for, for your work on editing The Gospel According to Paul. Uh, I did a book, Gospel According to Jesus. Another book, The Gospel According to the Apostles, and this is the final in that three-book trilogy. Though the I've proposed the, we take oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Isaiah one. 53 and yeah. call it The Gospel okay. According to God. That is. So, so this is The Gospel According to Paul. Um, it's, when is it going to be released? Uh, in time for Shepherd's, Shepherd's Conference. Shepherd's Conference. February, I think. That'll kind of be, I guess, the next step. And then the gospel according to God is Isaiah 53. Right. That, that's, uh, that's ready to go as yep. well. So, um, yeah, um, there are some, some other books. I, I, I'm doing a series of books uh, with Ligonier, and the first one will be out in a few months, and it's called uh, There Is No Other. And it's a, it's a wonderful little book on the doctrine of God, There Is No Other. There'll be three more. Uh, yeah, that's amazing too. It's maybe worth saying something about that. Those were those are all the sermons they've yeah. taken. All the sermons you've given at the Ligonier conferences over the years, and it, it it's surprisingly large number of sermons. Well, it's been about thirty years off and on that I've gone to Ligonier conferences, yeah. and they kept all the messages and they pulled them into categories and they came up with with four the books. four books uh, built around themes. Uh, the first one on the nature of God. Those are messages taken from all different years, mm. and uh, yeah, they, they pulled it all together, gave it to us, and your gifted son Jeremiah took a look at those and did yep. some edit work on them. And he's he's better than I am. I should retire and <laughs> let him take over. We need you both. <laughs> we need you both. So yeah, there was a little book that came out. Um, just got one called "Remember and Return." It's a little 30-day devotional taken from uh, the message to the church at Ephesus that was done by uh, Baker. Was it Baker Publishing? I don't know. But yeah, you know, when I think when, you, when I preach as long as I have and there's this much material, there's always, um, there's always the opportunity to do that. One thing that was in the bulletin this morning was really good was the index for the commentary series. Oh, yeah. Moody did an index so that you can literally have an index to every to, uh, to what's in all 33 volumes. So if you were looking up like the word uh, atonement, uh, you could look in there and it would tell you every volume, every page where that's discussed so you can kind of pull that together. Systematic theology is about 1,100 pages. Um, uh, Dick Mayhew and I, this has been his project for 15 years. And uh, when I finished the commentaries, I finally got on board to, to help him with it. And uh, the faculty from the seminary gave us a tremendous amount of input on it. But it is a comprehensive one-volume systematic theology covering every category of doctrine. Uh, it's exceptional. It's really, really good. And um, it's called Biblical Doctrine. It, it's coming in December or January. And the real objective of this is to get it translated into as many languages as we can so it gets into the hands of our missionaries in TMAI so they can use it as a systematic theology for the training of pastors and leaders around the world. Great. Great. Well, we are over time. Would you like to close in prayer? And Phil, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Tonight. Father, thank You again for what You've done in, in our lives through Your truth, through Your Word. Thank You for Phil and his friendship and partnership and support, strength and loyal love and great help through the years. Thank You for so many others like him who have enabled this ministry to be sustained and to, to be ca carried literally around the world. And this is Your Word, and, and we are... We are so honored to have been called to proclaim it. Um, we, we don't invent the message, we just 
preach it. Uh, ours is a ministry of, uh, of delivering the truth which You have already revealed. And You have honored Your Word that You're never going to allow Your truth to return void but always accomplish what You intend. I've seen that for about a half a century and so grateful to have seen it. And we thank You that we're continuing to see it and will even in the future. We thank You for all that You've done through Your Word around the world and in this wonderful church. Thank You for these precious people. Thank You for using them for Your glory, for enriching our lives through them. We give You thanks and praise for not only what You've done, what You're doing, but what awaits us as we walk in obedience to You. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank You.